welcome you to Midday Science Cafe. We have an exciting program today, Climate Change Solutions, Managing the Global Carbon Cycle. We have Nancy Freitas joining us and also Allegra Mayer. I wanna to start today with a land acknowledgement. We wanna recognize that Berkeley sits on the Huchun territory, the ancestral and unceded land of the Ohlone people, the successors of the, of the historic and sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone tribe and other familiar descendants of the Verona Band. Every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. Consistent with our values of community and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to native peoples. By offering this land acknowledgement, the Berkeley community not only recognizes the history of the land on which we stand, but also recognizes the Ohlone people are alive and flourishing members of the Berkeley and broader Bay Area communities today. So I am here as a representative, as the executive director of a program called Science at Cal at UC Berkeley. Science at Cal celebrates science through public programs. That's science cafes, lectures, festivals, and more. We're really excited to be here with LBNL, Lawrence Berkeley National Labs. But my website and email and Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, if you want to get a hold of us at Science at Cal, is listed right here on uh, the screen. We encourage you to connect with us, to join our listserv. To, we have lots of other programs, as you can see, especially as we've now moved online. We have a lot of programs that span lots of different uh, scientific topics and you can reach us from anywhere in the world. Um, I'm just going to go through a brief overview of what today will look like, of what our lectures, if you haven't been joining us for Midday Cafe, welcome. We typically start off by me introducing myself and then having our representative, Jen Tang from Berkeley Lab, come on and join as well. Um, we then have our first speaker. We will then go through some Q&A. So please, this is a reminder, use the Q&A function as you see in Zoom to ask us questions throughout the entire presentation because there'll be plenty of time to get those, those questions answered, both in the individual Q&A for each pre presenter and then at the end of the program when we all join together and have a really robust and lively conversation with our panelists. So with our speakers, excuse me. So after our first speaker goes and we answer some Q&A, we'll then have our second speaker, Nancy Freitas. We'll then have Q&A then, and then again, we'll bring it all together and wrap up together. I do wanna mention, again, continue to put things in the Q&A, but also this will be recorded. So if you want to share afterwards, share this presentation with friends and family and colleagues, or watch it again because you just found it that, that interesting, please do. There's an option to view it on our YouTube channel and we'll share, you, we'll share that with you um, after the program. So I am going to let Jen take over and describe Berkeley Lab and our partnership. Thanks so much, Dee. Hi, everybody. My name, uh, as Dee said, is Jen Tang. I'm the manager for federal and community relations at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Uh, for those who might not be aware, Berkeley Lab is one of 17 US Department of Energy national laboratories across the country that are tackling the critical scientific challenges of our time. Berkeley Lab is supported by DOE through its Office of Science and is managed by the University of California. Today, uh, actually, since our founding nearly 90 years ago by a UC Berkeley physics professor named Ernest Orlando Lawrence, Berkeley Lab has been dedicated to advancing the scope of human knowledge and seeking science solutions to some of the greatest problems facing humankind. Today, Berkeley Lab researchers develop sustainable energy and environmental solutions, create useful new materials, advance the frontiers of computing, and probe the mysteries of life, matter, and the universe. All of the research we conduct at the lab is unclassified. Our main campus is nestled in the Berkeley Hills, northeast of UC Berkeley, and we employ about 4,000 people, about 1,700 of whom are scientists, engineers, and faculty members. More than 500 of our employees are undergraduate and graduate students. These are scientists who are just beginning their research journey. Berkeley Lab's close proximity to Cal and our ties to the UC system create a unique and synergistic environment for scientific discovery. Many members of our community are affiliated with one of the UC campuses as students, postdocs, and professors with joint appointments at the lab. And as you can imagine, 
Berkeley Lab's relationship with UC Berkeley is especially close, and our institutions have joined forces to advance science on many frontiers. One of the main motivations for creating this Midday Science Cafe series is to share with you examples of compelling and complementary scientific research from both of our institutions. We hope you enjoyed today's presentation on the carbon cycle and carbon management, and we look forward to highlighting other science stories in the months ahead. Uh, and if you have ideas for interesting topics you'd like to hear about, uh, please feel free to put that in the chat function or use the Q&A function. Uh, with that, let me uh, point to this slide that we've got right now. If you're interested in following us on social media, please do. We're at Berkeley Lab. Uh, Dee, back to you. Thanks so much, Jen. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and go ahead and start presenting, or excuse me, start introducing our very first presenter today, which is Allegra Mayer. So Allegra is a PhD candidate in the Department of Environmental Science, Policy and Management at UC Berkeley, advised by Professor Wendy, Wendy Silver. She is also a graduate research scholar at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. So we actually have two labs and a university being presented here, um, working with Dr. Karis McFarlane at the Center for Accelerator Mass Spectrometry. She is generally interested in the balance of biogeochemical fluxes of carbon at the soil atmosphere interface. Her research has examined mechanisms and, and overall potential for carbon sequestration in soil at all scales, from global to, to molecular scales, with the motivation of understanding how managing landscapes can contribute to negative emissions and climate change mitigation. Her interest in soil carbon cycling stemmed from her undergraduate research in geochemistry at Northwestern, which led to a research fellowship on soil carbon persistence at the Max Planck Institute for Biogeochemistry in Germany. She hopes to continue working on solution-focused science throughout her career. So we, extremely, we are extremely excited to have you, Allegra. Please go ahead and take it away. Thank you so much, Dee and Jen. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Um, again, I'm Allegra Mayer. I'm a PhD candidate down at UC Berkeley and Lawrence Livermore National Lab, as Dee mentioned. And I'm gonna to talk to you today about managing carbon in soil and in general, the carbon cycle. So humans have caused a rapid warming of global surface temperatures ever since the industrial period. This figure is showing on the x-axis the year since 1960 and on the y-axis global warming relative to that industrial period in 1850. The Earth's surface has warmed a lot, you can see in the orange line, has, earned, has warmed about at present day one degree Celsius since the industrial period and continues to warm at an unprecedented rate. In fact, at the current trajectory, we're set to breach about 1.5 degree warming by the year 2040. Now, 1.5 degrees Celsius, which is about three degrees Fahrenheit, is an important limit because international scientists agree that further warming past 1.5 um, makes the risk of extreme weather events and ecosystem stress and extinctions and environmental injustices much more extreme. So this is a really important limit that we're trying to, trying to keep our warming below that. Now, global warming is determined by the concentration of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And so that depends on both past emissions, which we can no longer change, and also how much we decide to emit in the future. So this figure is showing total global emissions on the y-axis, positive here, and you can see actually we go negative below here, and the year since 2010 on the x-axis. And what we're seeing is that these blue pathways, in order to reach the, the goal of limiting warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, we need not only to drastically reduce our, our emissions, but actually also have negative emissions. Because it's not enough to get to zero, but in fact, we need negative emissions, which we can sometimes call carbon sequestration. Now, there are a number of positive, possible pathways for negative emissions, and one pathway I'm going to focus on today is drawing down and storing carbon in our plants and soils. Now, this might surprise you, but soil has a large capacity for carbon storage. Soil, the soil carbon pool actually stores more than, or about three times the amount of carbon as the carbon in the atmosphere, especially if we're talking down how deep soil is. So we're gonna to focus today on the fluxes from these arrows, 
and specifically how we can draw down more C from the atmosphere into vegetation through photosynthesis and then down from the vegetation into the soil carbon pool. So what is soil carbon sequestration? That's, it's, it's a word you might have heard before. Um, and in this presentation, we're going to talk about it as whenever the balance of inputs to the soil carbon pool is greater than the outputs. So you can think of soil organic carbon as a drippy sponge or a leaky bathtub. Whenever the water is poured in faster than the water leaks out, um, then the tub will start to fill up. And there are a few ecosystems where outputs are very low. It's, very, it's not leaky at all. Um, and those tend to be cold and wet areas like northern peatlands or the Arctic tundra. And Nancy will address that in her talk shortly. But in most ecosystems in temperate area or in many ecosystems, um, there's actually a big leak, which is decomposition. Um, and this is whenever microbes are breathing, they're respiring um, carbon dioxide and, and other gases as well. And so when, when the tub is leaking faster than the water is going in, that overall level of the pool is gonna go down, right? And the tub starts to empty. So in the case of soil carbon, we call this a carbon source to the atmosphere, when more carbon is leaving the soil than, than is um, entering. So most industrially farmed croplands are carbon sources. Also California grasslands, ever since, um, ever since it was invaded by annual grasses, California grasslands are also sources of carbon to the atmosphere right now. So because those are currently carbon sources, we're gonna be focusing on managing croplands and California grasslands in the rest of this talk. So how can we manage, manage soil carbon? Well, by reducing the leakiness, by reducing that decomposition rate, we can increase, again, the soil carbon pool, right? So soil carbon sequestration is one option for negative emissions. Now managing soil carbon stocks might seem like a daunting task, but actually there's a lot of land area globally that's already managed. This map is showing you the agricultural land in the, in all across the globe with cropland labeled as red and grazing land or grasslands that are being grazed um, in green. So you can see that the expanse of, of agricultural land means that if we implement some management techniques worldwide to these areas, there could be a meaningful effect on the global carbon cycle. And to add to that, much of this agricultural land has been losing carbon since cultivation began. And you can see how much of a source this is, as, uh, that it's losing carbon by how red it is, right? So everything from yellow to red labeled on this map is losing carbon actively. It's a carbon source to the atmosphere. The blue, there are a the few blue areas where carbon is being gained. But so we can see that almost all of those croplands and grasslands are sources of carbon. And we wondered if management were adjusted to accumulate rather than to lose soil carbon, could this actually transfer enough carbon from the atmosphere to the soil to make a dent in climate change? Well, we already know that there are multiple agricultural management practices that can lead to soil carbon sequestration. We've measured it, we've, you know, we've done the field experiments and measured an increase in soil carbon. And these practices include cover cropping and a cropland, or returning the residue of, the, of what you harvest back to the soil can increase your, your soil carbon. Sowing legumes like, um, like alfalfa, and adding organic amendments, which I'm going to focus on later in this talk. This is a compost pile out in Marin. So we looked at published studies measuring the rates of, these, of the carbon sequestration of all of these management techniques. Um, and we calculated the global potential. How much could we possibly, you know, if we apply this to all of the agricultural land, how much could we possibly sequester just through these low-tech management practices? And what we found is, is that so we used a climate model emulator to translate these practices to how much warming would be reduced. So we calculated, calculated that the technical potential of the practice, in addition to reducing our emissions, can actually reduce warming by 0.3 degrees Celsius through the next century. And again, 0.3 degrees might sound like a small amount to you, but let's remember this is more than half of the remaining allowable warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. So that's not nothing. And it's a very exciting finding, in fact, that again, these low tech, low tech um, management practices can actually have, have such a big impact. So now I'm gonna zoom into California to look at one of the management strategies here that could be applicable on a wide scale. 
So adding compost, this is a compost pile out in Marin, adding compost to grassland is a strategy that not only diverts waste from landfills and manure lagoons, which are big sources of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, but, but adding compost to grassland has also been shown to increase soil carbon stocks, at least out in Marin, and it also increases water holding capacity and soil fertility. So there are a number of co-benefits. So our lab, the Silver Lab, has demonstrated carbon sequestration from compost for over the last 10 years. But I wanted to know, you know, Marin is a glorious place. Can, can applying compost to grasslands be effective in other less productive environments? So how sensitive is, is, carbon, is carbon sequestration from compost to differences in climate throughout California and also differences in soil types? So in collaboration with local land stewards and land managers, the Silver Lab and other volunteers applied compost to 15 sites throughout California and they're labeled here. I chose seven of the most climatically different sites labeled in the colors to simulate how we expect the carbon cycle to be affected by a one-time compost application. So we see these dry sites out in Tulare and San Diego and a very wet site in Mendocino to get the full spectrum. And what we found is that at least the results from the earliest sites again here pictured as Marin, show that that one-time compost amendment, the compost amendment was added to these yellow boxes and the control sites are, are next to them, showed that that one-time compost amendment increases productivity or the amount of grass growing compared to the control. And you might be able to see if you look carefully at this image that there's more, actually more grass. And if you were there in person, you'd be able to tell. But even if you can't tell, um, just look at what the cows like better. So we can we measured um, we measured on the ground that there is an increase in both grass growth, so we call that net primary productivity, and also in soil carbon over the last ten years. But we also modeled it out into the future, and and what we found is that these differences in productivity um, continue to increase for decades, for at least two decades, and this increase in growth also occurred occurs below grounds yielding um, a carbon sink, at least, for, uh, at least for that period of time. And it lasts throughout the next century. And so I'll show you some model results from one of our sites. And most of these results look very similar throughout all of the sites. We found that um, on the y-axis, or on the x-axis is year after amendment. And on the y-axis here, you're seeing essentially the amount of carbon dioxide being drawn out of the atmosphere and metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalents. And so we do know we have to account for the greenhouse gas emissions from compost because compost is a, a yummy food for microbes. And so they're gonna breathe a little bit more. Um, and so we found that there's, there's nitrous oxide emissions from compost and that's labeled here in blue. So that's a source to the atmosphere here. But in green, we see all of the, the soil carbon that's been increased because of compost. So if we subtract the blue from the green, we get our net benefit, which is here in black. And you can see that that net benefit, you know, continues to increase for about 20 years after the initial amendment and continues to be a positive climate benefit through the end of the century. So that was a surprising and very exciting finding. We did a scale up estimate. So if we added, if we added one time a, a quarter inch of compost to the whole ecoregion represented by those seven sites, which is about 40% of California, we found that that would um, account for more than 8% of California's 2030 emissions target. That's coming right up um, to reduce emissions to 1990 levels. So this is, this is something that can help chip away with California. And it's not, um, we found that it would be true no matter what the future precipitation might be. And also throughout California, despite the different weathers and, and climates in each site. So it's a very exciting finding. And in conclusion, I wanna, I wanna remind us that we're not talking about carbon offsets when we're talking about carbon sequestration. Greenhouse gas emissions must also be reduced. Uh, we showed that the more emissions are reduced, actually the more impactful that soil carbon sequestration management could be as an additional climate change mitigation tool. And then finally, um, I hope you learned that carbon management and agriculture is a low tech option. It can be deployed very quickly. In fact, right now, some, some places it's already being deployed and contributes an important piece of a solution. And with that, I'd like to take any questions.
you might have, um, thanks to the people who I work with and looking forward to hearing from Nancy. Thank you so much, Allegra. We do actually have a really great, great question from an audience member right now about sort of your last comment, um, which is even with these kinds of findings, how difficult do you think it would be to get farmers, owners, et cetera, to make these changes? You said some of these, it's being implemented in some places. Is it really a, a large scale solution and, and would that be difficult to implement large scale? Thanks for that question. You know, it really depends on what you're talking about. If we're specifically talking about compost, it's going to depend on how accessible um, that rancher um, is to whether they're making their own compost, then it becomes really easy. Um, mm -hmm. If they're nearby an industrial compost um, facility, then that becomes pretty simple. To really answer your question, I think that um, incentives, especially policy incentives and financial incentives in the society that we're in right now um, is is gonna make things much easier. So uh, if we're yeah. talking about making things simple, talk to your policymakers. Awesome, are you in contact with um, farmers currently about these solutions? Yeah, absolutely, mm -hmm. um, especially the, uh, the ranchers whose mm -hmm. sites I, we were working with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, my next question has to do with that beautiful plot you pulled up, um, the climate benefit curve. Yeah. So I'm curious, just because you have your, your slides still up, I'm going to ask this question. Would you expect then, if you went maybe after 80 years, when that benefit starts to trickle off and you did another compost regimen, would you expect that curve to look the same or to be less effective as a, a climate change benefit? That's a great question, Dee. Um, actually, I, there is some unknown, but I do believe that if we waited 80 years after mm -hmm. the, um, the initial addition, mm -hmm. it becomes, it's starting to reach, you see more of a plateau, a little bit more mm -hmm. of a steady state. You, even if you, uh, if you added carbon again, we would certainly see another increase, whether it would increase the exact same amount that is something that's up for debate right now and something I'm excited about continuing to study um, because of a number of things and I'd be happy to get into it further if yeah. people are interested. But I do expect that there would be another increase in, in soil carbon, yes. Yeah, so it's an even, it's a long-term solution. It's an even longer term solution if you're doing kind of cycles of these compost um, deployments. Awesome. Well, I'm gonna go ahead and, and hand it over then to Jen to let um, Nancy take over just so we can have more Q&A time at the end of the presentation. So thank you again, Allegra. Yes, thanks so much, Olga, for that great presentation. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Nancy Freitas. So Nancy grew up in Tucson, Arizona, and received a Bachelor of Science degree in Environmental Science from the University of Arizona. After she graduated, she worked in environmental conservation with the Peace Corps in Paraguay, and then helped run the Biodiversity Project, which is a STEM outreach project at the University of Arizona. As a graduate student in UC Berkeley's Energy and Resources Group, her research focuses on how a warming climate affects carbon cycling in the Arctic. She's currently working with the Department of Energy funded Next Generation Ecosystem Experiment in the Arctic. At, uh, and that's uh, part of a team that Berkeley Lab is, is working on. Uh, Berkeley Lab is developing a larger picture of these processes and uses a combination of field research, lab work, and data science to do so. Nancy's also dedicated to making connections between how to ask more inclusive research questions and how to better communicate research in ways that affect people's understanding of environmental change. Nancy, over to you. And I think you're on mute. Can you hear me now? Perfect. Awesome. Um, so thank you, Jen and Dee, for having me. Um, as Jen mentioned, uh, my name is Nancy Freitas, and I work um, at the Terrestrial Biogeochemistry Lab at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, and I'm also a student in the Energy and Resources Group at UC Berkeley. Um, and today we're going to be talking about Arctic lakes, so a little farther north um, than what Allegra was talking about. So the first thing we're going to talk about is um, why we study the Arctic. So as an Arizonan, um, I initially thought of the Arctic as somewhere that was really far north and totally covered um, in ice and snow. But once I started working there, um, I realized that this is actually a very ecologically rich region. Um, it's 
you know, there are ice shells and there is snow, um, but the landscape also supports tundra and really tall mountain ranges. Um, there are wetlands and lakes and ponds too, um, like you see in this picture. And all of that um, difference in ecology not only supports plants and animals on the landscape, um, but it also supports uh, indigenous peoples who have lived uh, on the landscape for uh, thousands of years. Um, so it's, it's a really important region. Um, and then what we're going to be talking about today is how this landscape serves as a global carbon sink. Um, so as a reminder, Allegra talked about this, that means that uh, this landscape is pulling in carbon um, and sequestering it uh, in the ground and in the soil. So the Arctic is changing rapidly. Um, we know that global average temperatures have risen about one degree Fahrenheit over the past century. Uh, but because these are averages, um, it actually looks very different on the ground level. So these are pictures of Alaska. Um, and we can see in the top left graph that yearly average temperatures in Alaska um, have actually risen several degrees since the mid 1900s. Um, and this is represented in the picture uh, on the right um, in terms of what those annual average temperatures look like in the blue. But on the bottom, um, we can see projected changes going, moving into the future um, in the two red images. And what those show is that um, during our lifetimes, we might see Alaska, which is one of the coldest places in the US, uh, actually rise in temperature by 16 to 17 degrees Fahrenheit. And that is substantial um, when we think about some of the ground being frozen. And so that frozen ground is called permafrost. Um, and it's generally in the Arctic, permafrost has been frozen for millennia. Um, and it underlies much of the Arctic. So to orient you a little bit better on this picture, um, on the top, I hope you can see my pointer, on the top, um, this is Alaska, and down here in the bottom um, in the white is Greenland. And we can see from 2003 to 2017 that the amount um, of white covered land area, so that's continuous permafrost, has decreased in size. And simultaneously, the blue area has increased um, in terms of its extent in the Arctic, and those are areas that are thawing um, more consistently. So to understand what's happening here, we're gonna zoom in um, to the ground level in Alaska and talk about the carbon cycle. Um, and we're gonna talk about that in terms of inputs and outputs. So this is what has been happening in the past. Um, like Allegra said, uh, these ecosystems are cold. Um, and so they actually sequester and they take in carbon um, that's then frozen and stored for a really long time. Um, this can be from plants or animals um, and, and the atmosphere. But with climate warming, what we're seeing is that um, these, these areas are starting to thaw out and microbes in the soil that have been dormant and frozen for a really long time um, are starting to wake up. And when they do this, um, like humans, when we wake up, they're really hungry. And so they start eating the plant material that's around them. Um, and that has been previously frozen. And what that can do um, is it can be released by microbes um, as a byproduct. And those byproducts, um, unfortunately for us, are carbon dioxide and methane, um, which are potent greenhouse gases. And we know that, that those are uh, contributing to a huge source of warming um, in our atmosphere. And so we're curious how much um, you know, these microbes might contribute um, to, to a growing problem. Um, because it means that the Arctic could become an important source of carbon to the atmosphere. So no longer just a sink, but also a source. So, we're gonna talk about how ponds and lakes fit into the picture because that's what I study. So in the picture on the left, um, you can see a satellite image of the northernmost part of Alaska. The blue is ocean and the green is land. Um, and so generally about 6% of the Arctic landscape um, is covered in water, but in some areas like this image, it's more like 40%. 
So if you see all of those little speckled dark dots on the landscape, um, those are small ponds and lakes. And the picture on the right shows a zoomed in view of what one of those ponds look, looks like. Um, pretty unobtrusive looking, you know, it's quite pretty actually. Um, and as the climate warms, we can expect, at least initially, that, you know, as ice thaws, or like as ground thaws and ice melts, um, we might see more of these ponds starting to pop up. But let's talk about what's happening underneath the ponds. Um, this is an image um, of the thawed out layer um, that can result below one of these very small ponds. Um, so as we talked about, when permafrost thaws, microbes in the soil can release carbon dioxide and methane. Um, and we're learning that these small ponds and lakes can actually thaw out areas that are much deeper below them um, than the surrounding land areas, like these ones, um, that are just affected by increasing atmospheric temperature. And the reason for this is that water um, is able to carry thermal energy and that's able to percolate down through the soil. Um, and so carbon that's at the very bottom um, of uh, the thawed out zone below lakes hasn't actually been part of our um, like atmospheric carbon cycle for thousands of years. So once that starts to thaw, if microbes can release carbon dioxide and methane from deep, deep down, um, that can contribute a new source of carbon to our atmosphere. Um, and there are some studies right now that are saying that adding methane to our models could have an effect that's similar to land use change, which is the second largest source of human-made warming um, on the planet. So it's pretty significant, um, but many of our, our models don't actually project climate changes, um, or sorry, many of our models that project climate changes don't actually incorporate lakes into them. Um, as they currently stand. And there are a few reasons for this. Um, the first is that, um, you know, these, these systems are complicated. Lakes exist at uh, the interface of the atmosphere um, and the soil and vegetation that exists on this landscape. Um, and they're changing pretty rapidly. Uh, so, you know, like we, we can't model individual lakes across the entire Arctic, Arctic, but we do need to know what's going on with them. And collecting samples uh, is difficult, both in terms of labor and costs. Um, you know, and then we have to find graduate students to run samples and labs for a year. Um, so can be difficult to do. But um, I was a graduate student who was really interested in this. And so that's exactly what I've been doing uh, for the past few years. So my research questions looking at um, the Alaskan landscape were how much greenhouse gas could lakes release and how fast could we expect these changes to happen. I um, am working at, well, my study site is Goldstream Lake in um, Alaska. It's just outside of Fairbanks and it's about halfway up the state, which is an area where permafrost is thawing and refreezing. So it's not continuously frozen. Um, on the picture on the left, you can see that um, the research group that I'm working with pulled up a 60 foot long sediment core from below one of these, or from below Goldstream Lake. Um, and to our knowledge, that's the deepest core that's been taken from one of these lakes. Uh, so that's pretty exciting. And then the sediment was taken in segments back to uh, a lab in Alaska. Um, and I flew up to Alaska and um, was able to take samples um, from these sediment cores. And then I sent them back to Lawrence Berkeley lab um, to start manipulating them and see, see what was going to happen if I changed things like oxygen and temperature. So this is what um, my day-to-day -day looks like, uh, looked like, because now I'm done. Um, but on the left, you can see uh, jars that I put the sediment in and I sealed them off um, and then I either expose them to oxygen or I expose them to an environment without oxygen. Um, because we know, you know, as these lakes start to form and drain, those oxygen conditions might change. I also expose them to four degrees, 10 degrees, or 20 degrees of temperature for a full year. 
And then I took gas samples um, from each of the jars. Um, it started out, you know, once a week. And by the end of the incubation period, it was about once a month, just to see what, what they were doing. I ran those samples on a machine called a gas chromatograph, and that can be seen on the right. Um, and there's actually a little syringe down here that shows you how it's inserted um, or injected into the machine. And um, then the instrument tells me how much methane and carbon dioxide um, are in that gas sample. So exciting news. Um, I just finished up the incubations and they ran for a whole year. Um, and again, you know, it's a lot of work. Uh, I took about 5,000 gas samples and ran them by hand um, on this instrument. Uh, so I'm gonna show you some of the preliminary results that are associated with this project. Um, but I just wanna preface this by saying that um, you all are some of the first people to see data from this project. Um, and it's a good time to remind everyone that science is a bit of a process. Um, it's not necessarily a linear process. And so um, I don't have all of the answers about what this data is yet or what, what it's uh, saying to us, what the story is that it's telling. So I'm gonna show segments of the data. I'm gonna show the first 50 days of carbon dioxide and the first 100 days of methane. So this is um, a graph of carbon dioxide. And what it's showing is on the X axis, we have uh, the number of days that the incubation was running for. And on the Y axis, um, we have the amount of carbon dioxide that was released um, as carbon. And then in the legend on the right, you can see that the colors on the graph correspond to different depths of soil that were incubated. Um, and just to orient you a little bit better, um, the deepest soils are the ones that have thawed, we think, most recently, um, as that, that thawed out area extends farther and farther down into the permafrost. So the general trend that we can see here is that there's this pulse of carbon dioxide that's released, and then it kind of levels out um, over the next few days. Granted, there are another 200 to 300 incubation days um, associated with this data, so it'll be interesting to see what happens after this point. We can also see that the deepest soils were releasing um, some of the largest pulses of greenhouse gas of carbon dioxide. Um, which is, which is quite interesting. Um, next, we're gonna look at methane. Um, methane looks very different than carbon dioxide. Um, and this, again, is the first 100 days, um, so we can pull out some more trends here. Um, and again, the x-axis shows sampling interval in terms of the number of days, and then the y-axis shows the amount of methane that was released. Um, and then the legend uh, again, orients you to depth um, by color and temperature. Um, so there was very little methane that was released at the beginning of these incubations, but then it really picked up, um, both in terms of the speed that it was being re released at, so the slope of those lines, and the quantity of methane that's being released. And so just to give you an idea, our atmospheric methane levels are, are close to zero. They're around like, you know, like a 1.8 um, uh, parts parts per million, um, and, and this is uh, quite a bit higher than that. Um, and this, the reason that this graph is different than the CO2 graph in terms of trends um, are because we have different processes that are going on microbially in the soil. Um, and so long-term incubations can actually capture both of these, which is pretty cool. Uh, so let's talk about what this means. Um, so generally, speaking, what I'm gleaning from this data is that Arctic landscapes that look like these are already changing. Um, and our lake systems are actually adding fuel to that fire. Um, and they could be driving larger and faster changes. Um, this has already been shown in the literature and, and my lake and study site are another example um, of, of the fact that this is happening. And the amount of carbon dioxide and methane um, that I think are being released by my lake system um, are not trivial. Um, and, and so the speed that this is happening at um, is quite important, actually. Um, and so I'm hopeful that when I analyze the rest of the data um, for this project that I can potentially present a strong enough case that I think that it should lakes and ponds should be integrated into a large model that the Department of Energy is building um, 
across several national labs um, and, and really make a case for including lakes and ponds um, in that model. And it's, I think it's also important to remember when we look at these systems that while they're up north and they seem disconnected um, from what we see outside of our windows um, here in California, for example, uh, any additional warming in greenhouse gas release that happens globally affects the Arctic. And then if the Arctic releases greenhouse gases in turn, those can then affect us. So we have decisions to make. Um, the atmosphere in the picture on the left is the exact same global atmosphere as the picture on the right in terms of the carbon cycle. Um, and for anyone not familiar with the picture on the right, this is a picture I took last week um, in very smoky and foggy conditions in Northern California. Um, so we know that permafrost thaw that has already happened is irreversible um, kind of during our lifetimes. Um, but whether or not it continues um, at the rate that it is, um, is ultimately up to us to make a decision about. And um, climate and policy decisions that we make moving forwards are uh, quite crucial um, and will play an extremely big role uh, in what kind of future both of these environments uh, have. Um, and so with that, I will take questions. Nancy, thanks so much for that great presentation. Um, we've got a couple questions coming in from our audience. And so the first one I'll ask you is, how do new models of climate forcing, uh, such as global warming potential, which considers a lifetime of methane differently, change predictions of these thawing events? Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question one more time? Sure, definitely. How do new models of climate forcing, uh, such as global warming potential, which considers the lifetime of methane differently, change predictions of these thawing events? Um, you know, that's a great question. Um, I don't know the exact answer to this question, um, but I can uh, harbor a guess that because these systems are not well integrated into models yet, um, they're, they're actually not being represented in terms of longer um, timeframes that methane might be affecting our atmosphere for. Um, so I'm uh, kind of pushing for their integration into models and then we might be able to deduce um, what that means after right. that. Thank you. Um, so you talked a little bit about how, um, how the NG Arctic project is working to integrate lakes and ponds into the global simulation, right? Can you talk a little bit more about that process? What does that involve? So to be clear, um, the NG Arctic project is not actually working to integrate um, lakes and ponds at this exact time. Um, this is kind of like a, a sub interest. Um, they are very focused on the terrestrial ecosystem um, and the atmospheric interactions um, and are starting to consider like what, what this might look like um, if we do integrate ponds and lakes. Um, but generally speaking, that process involves um, a lot of iterations between um, field work and modeling teams. And so there, uh, you know, the uh, NG Arctic project is in its third phase um, right now, which means that it has gone through three multi-year phases where people go out to field sites and they collect data um, and they run that data or they run those samples for, you know, X amount of time. And then they, um, use that data to help create parameters that go into um, shaping models. Um, and modelers are working very hard um, to then give information back to uh, field scientists and back and forth. Um, yeah, thanks so much. Get these great models going. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you for those thoughtful answers to those questions. Let me actually ask you to stop sharing your screen. I'm going to ask Dee and Allegra to rejoin us and we'll kick off our Q&A session. Hi folks, welcome back. Hello, how are you? How is everybody? Allegra, you're back. <laughs> All right, so let me go ahead and ask you a question then. Um, I know you might need to include a definition here. So one of our, our audience members asked, what impact do you think biochar so define biochar for us first, I think. What impact do you think biochar could have on carbon soil sequestration? Yeah, I'll take that one. 
Um, biochar is, can be a number of different things. Um, and it's, it depends on what feedstock. So biochar is a, a broad term that describes a number of different things. And it's generally uh, some kind of biomass. It could be um, leaves or, or it's usually kind of some kind of wood product um, that's burned without, with much less oxygen. Um, so it's not releasing that much uh, greenhouse gas into the atmosphere as it's, as it's being pyrolyzed. And what you're left with is um, this material that kind of looks like charcoal and it's, it's in a, a compound that's chemically quite hard to break down for microbes. So it's not yummy at all. Um, and biochar has been posited as a way if we kind of crumble up biochar, scatter it on grasslands or even on croplands to use it um, either as a very, very slow release fertilizer or just as a, a way to store carbon in soil. Um, the thing with biochar, that's a good question. There's been a lot of research on it or and, and ongoing research and there's a lot of unknowns. Um, some studies think that have, have shown that there um, seems to be quite a, a really exciting possibility for biochar to sequester carbon um, and to maybe even improve some amount of soil fertility. Uh, but other studies show the opposite. So there is a lot of unknown there and it is a really exciting opportunity um, for a study. Uh, we almost included it in our, our global modeling uh, exercise when we were translating the temperature. But in the end, it was so controversial with reviewers that we decided not to. So um, that might help answer your question. <laughs> so what was the controversial part? Just that there's so many unknowns? Right, that the, the effect is really different depending on what it is and where it is and who's studying it. Great. It's still very exciting. I don't think it means that you, I don't think there's a negative impact, but the positive impact is, is quite um, unknown. Great, thank you. So another question for you. Um, while I'm at it. Um, <laughs> what's the source of the compost? How would you prevent invasive plant seeds, which can create their own huge problem? Yeah, thanks for that question. The compost that we, there are there are multiple ways, just like biochar, there are multiple feedstocks for compost. Um, the one that we applied to the 15 sites throughout California is a mixture of green waste, which is like your yard waste, um, residue from essentially cow manure, like the sludge from a, a, a manure lagoon, um, and a little bit of, of goat bedding, I believe too, or horse bedding. Um, and that's all composted. And because it's industrially composted in, in windrows, uh, it goes to a very, very high temperature. And because it's so hot and it's rotated regularly, um, those pathogens and in general, anything living well, besides those microbes who are eating um, and composting the material, uh, is broken down and, and dies. So we applied compost at the beginning of, of the Marin Carbon Project. They applied compost throughout California and really monitored very carefully the um, species, whether or not it, there were an invasive species, and they definitely found that there were no invasive species there. So um, I, that's, that's a question that we get asked regularly. And the fact of the matter is that there's um, so far no evidence that that's an issue at all. And we've been looking. Thank you. Yeah, great. So we've got a couple questions for Nancy about her research in the Arctic. And uh, the first one is, have you seen any change over time in the amount or size of the lakes and ponds in the Arctic that you're researching? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, these changes are happening on a, a yearly basis. And um, so last year, I actually was able to go up to Alaska um, with another graduate student and help her with her work. And she was able to show us pictures of a small crack that um, there was in the landscape the previous year that had widened into basically a small thaw pond. Um, and that happened year to year. And this is something that we're seeing with um, not just new ponds and lakes that are forming, but existing ponds and lakes um, that are actually thawing out along the margins. Um, and if you were really perceptive and looked really close at some of those diagrams, um, they were a little hard to see. Um, there were trees, I drew trees that were like tilting 
Um, and the reason for this is that as those margins widen on the lakes, um, the the permafrost thaws out below these trees um, and it actually causes them to tilt and fall over. Um, so it's, it's another way of seeing that change happen on the landscape. Thanks, Nancy. Um, another question uh, is, what is your sense of the modeling undertaking needed to quantify releases via remote sensing at the lakes you're studying? Uh, for example, taking into account the different variables like size or depth or you know, the general region and geologic considerations. Mm, that's a great question. Um, I, I don't have a, a, a great sense of what is needed um, uh, on the modeling side in order to make that happen. Um, I do know that there are people who are working on this um, extensively uh, up in Alaska, like with the, the group that I'm actually working with right now. Um, and I think, generally speaking, we need, we need to know um, how different kind, like different levels of temperature are going to um, affect these systems. We need to know um, how different nutrients in the soil are going to affect whether microbes um, are productive or not. Um, we need to know, uh, you know, how old the carbon is that they're releasing, um, whether it's new or, um, or, or if it's quite old, like, you know, hundreds of thousands of years old. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there, there are like tons of different uh, parameters that we can incorporate in these models. And I think remote sensing um, has the ability to elucidate some of that for us. Thank you, great answer. Um, so we've got a question for, for maybe both of you. Uh, and this is, you know, in addition to soil, uh, the world's oceans and forests are also considered pretty effective carbon sinks. But will the rate at which the land and ocean can sequester carbon continue to keep pace with rising carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas emissions? OK, I'll start this one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the answer is that we're seeing already that um, the ocean as a carbon sink is decreasing. So absolutely, the ocean is absorbing carbon dioxide. Um, and it's acidifying the ocean. You've probably heard about that. And uh, that the there's a rate past which that, that will start to saturate and slow down. So we'll do we will we do expect to see um, a slowing. So it, we will not be keeping pace with emissions as if they're continued business as usual. Um, with regard to forests, forests act in particular as a carbon sink when they're growing. So um, as a, very few ecosystems are in steady state per se, but when forests are growing, they tend to um, take a lot of carbon out of the atmosphere and incorporate that into their biomass, uh, which is their trunks and their leaves. Um, and that's a, a huge tool for carbon sequestration if they're growing. Um, and that starts to slow down as, as they reach maturity. Um, they don't become a source or anything, but they do kind of become more neutral. Um, I think, Nancy, you might wanna add to this. Yeah, I, what I would like to add is that, um, as Allegra mentioned, uh, you know, the ocean may become saturated um, if we continue on our, our same emissions pathway. Um, and so I think the important thing to remember here too, um, which both of us tried to touch on in our presentations, is that um, what, what decisions we make moving forwards um, are pretty integral in kind of these global effects um, of uh, temperature increase and, and um, release of greenhouse gases into our atmosphere. Um, so we don't necessarily have to walk down that path um, if we are able to reduce emissions, um, sequester carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, um, then there's the potential that that doesn't need to happen. Thanks both for those answers. Yeah. So. How about this question for Allegra? Um, have you looked at the application of compost on burned areas? I mean, we're experiencing these fires now, right? This seems very kind of timely question. Do they have my, uh, the microbial power to utilize the compost? That's a great question. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for asking it. Mm -hmm. um, actually, some of our trial sites out in Yuba County did get burned. Actually, just half of the site got burned, which is perfect because now we have a new experiment that compost was applied to uh, a few plots and, and there was a control plot right next to it. Half of each of them got burned. I don't know how that possibly the luck 
to have that happen um, is incredible. So now we have compost amended and burned grassland, unburned right next to it, also controlled, burned and unburned. Um, mm. So we'll have the answer for you soon, at least uh, in California grassland, which is really exciting in some ways. Of course, it's tragic in other ways. Um, my prediction or would be that it depends on the severity of the fire. Um, and I'm by no means a fire ecologist, but I do believe that um, soil insulates microbes to some degree and depends on how hot the fire is going to be to how impacted that microbial community is. Uh, so that's my short answer. <laughs> yeah. And that actually leads us into the next question, which um, one of our viewers asked. So you discussed trying uh, the compost in different areas, right? But they didn't quite hear if that had led to any differences. Um, and this is one example of a difference. So I can see that very you know, distinctly in an area that's been burned. But what about the other locations? Were you seeing differences in, in uh, site by site specifically? Yeah, thanks for asking about that. Um, we did we saw some differences, but all, but they were minor compared to the overall treatment effect. Mm. So the treatment effect, certainly compo applying compost is very different than the control in all of the sites, um, which was really exciting. We expected the drier and, and less productive sites to have less of an impact, like in San Diego and Tulare, but actually they had the, the longest lasting effects in terms of carbon sequestration. So even though it started on slower, we actually saw more carbon being sequestered there. Um, and that might be because of rainfall stimulating greenhouse gases as well. So that it, because it's so dry there, there's less stimulation there um, in terms of microbial respiration. Uh, but for the most part, we saw across the board compost treatment more climate beneficial than control. Right. Yeah. I was going to ask, so why? But <laughs> so you guys are thinking about that. That might be for the next grad student. <laughs> um, so um, in terms of carbon sequestration and its future effects, are there possible negative effects that could come up like a possible release of carbon that was sequestered or something along those lines? That's a good question. I, I think, um, Nancy is kind of answering that with her yeah. with her uh, presentation, in the sense that absolutely um, soil carbon and any any carbon stored in kind of an active state is absolutely vulnerable. We see that with our wildfires right now, releasing, you know, like we said, forests are a huge sink for carbon when they're growing. But if that is burned, the carbon is being released to the atmosphere, so it immediately becomes a source. Um, so it does require constant management and careful management. And Nancy can talk about you know, the source of carbon when this, this sink, this previous sink in the permafrost is, uh, is released. Yeah, no, I think that was great. That covered it. <laughs> I was going to say, Nancy, do you want to add anything? But you got it. <laughs> that was great. Okay. Um, you know, and sort of similar to, to the discussion we're having, going back to sort of the bigger picture, do you, do either of you have a sense of how much of a reduction in human emissions would be needed in addition to the sequestration strategies you've talked about? Go for it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, the um, International Panel on Climate Change, um, that figure that I showed at the beginning of my presentation, essentially indicated that human emissions need to be reduced to zero. Like the net emissions need to be zero and, and even negative. So if we are emitting, it would continue to emit um, greenhouse gases, those need to be more than offset. Uh, I know um, that's not, a, not the answer we necessarily <laughs> were hoping for, but. <laughs> Well, thank you, thank you for that answer. Uh, you know, yes, it's not the answer we're hoping for, but it, it is the reality. Um, you know, also referring to that IPCC report, you know, it looks like equity issues will certainly be exacerbated if we exceed that 1.5 degrees Celsius. Can you talk a little bit about how climate change will affect the global equity issues that we're all thinking about right now? Yeah, so Nance, I'll take the broader picture. Okay. Um, Thank you for letting me have this airtime. <laughs> uh, yeah, 
one of the, the findings of the IPCC report that we just talked about, the International Panel on Climate Change, is that that warming past 1.5 degrees Celsius um, will um, have a greater impact on more vulnerable populations. So, and when I say more vulnerable, I mean economically more vulnerable, tend to be um, areas where it are gonna be hit the hardest by extreme weather events, hurricanes, droughts, floods. Of course, it's not only those people, but they tend to be um, overrepresented in terms of, of how they're impacted by these events. Uh, similarly, those the, for those same reasons that would tend to actually exacerbate um, inequalities in terms and economic inequalities as well. So yeah. that's what the finding showed. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I was just gonna say, um, to, I think we can like zoom into California right now um, and think about what's happening on a local level in terms of like equity issues um, and, and the compounding effects of climate change. Um, so if we think about um, the fires that are happening right now, um, it's not just, I mean, the destruction is massive, um, but it's also the ability to rebuild after those fires. Um, it's the ability to insure houses um, in different areas and whether insurance companies are able to pull out of those areas. Because if they do that, then, um, you know, populations that are lower income um, are bearing the burden of higher risk um, in those areas and, um, and, you know, may not be able to continue living in the same ways um, that, that they were before. Um, I also think that, you know, we already see that, um, that, you know, climate change disproportionately affects people and is disproportionately affecting people um, in like along racial lines, along socioeconomic lines, um, in terms of air quality issues. Um, and these have been extremely well documented for decades. And if we think about the fires, um, we know that if you don't have health care, um, if that's tied to your job and you lose your job in a pandemic, then, um, or at all, then the impacts that you sustain from wildfire smoke inhalation and anything else that is in that smoke um, will continue potentially to affect you for a longer period of time because you can't get the care that you need. So global equity issues are, are huge and they're um, kind of astounding uh, in terms of their impact. And then they're very visible already on a local scale. Thanks, Nancy. And thanks, Allegra, for those answers. Um, you know, we've been sort of talking about big picture. I'd like to bring it back down to um, your specific presentations. We got a question for you, Nancy, um, about uh, permafrost. So has there been carbon dating of the permafrost over depth? Uh, yes, there has been. And we actually um, did some carbon dating on, on the core that um, I am looking at. Um, and some of the information there suggests that uh, the permafrost that's being uh, degraded at depth is uh, over 50,000 years old um, and may be significantly older than that. Um, and this is you know, one study site. There have been many, many that have been looking at this um, too. Got it. Uh, and then one more question for you, Nancy. Um, so how, uh, how representative do you think your field site is uh, compared to other lakes and ponds in the Arctic? How can you know that that's representative? That's a great question. Um, and I think that it's one as, you know, a scientist that many people think about um, in terms of their research. And um, the short answer is that this area um, that we're studying the, this lake system in um, is, is in kind of an intermediate um, thaw range where the permafrost has not been frozen there um, completely for many, many years. Um, and so it kind of represents what might happen in the future already. Um, and so we think that that could be representative um, of a larger ecosystem effect. Um, you know, there's no way to know for sure based on one lake if that can be scaled up to the Arctic. My sense is no, um, which is one of the reasons why we have to continue doing this kind of work um, and, and seeing how, you know, as we integrate different parameters that involve lakes and ponds into models, how that affects our projections of climate and how, um, 
whether it's able to account for any of the differences that we've seen in the past um, between what's actually happening in the climate and what we're modeling. Thank you, Nancy. Yeah, so Allegra, we actually have two questions that have to do with the application of the compost. So the first question is that when you say application, do you, do you simply mean spreading the compost on the surface? Yeah, so you might have seen, I should have been explicit about it, but you might have seen that picture um, below the initial compost pile when I was talking about that. There's a yeah. guy with a tractor just spewing out compost over the land. And mm. what we mean for this experiment is applying a quarter inch, which is not that much, a quarter inch of compost across the land. Yeah. Yeah. So just so spreading it with a tractor. Yeah, okay. So then the next question, which I said was related to this application is, would, would compost application to the subsoil, like tilling, liquid injections, those sorts of things, improve the sequestration? That's a good question too. Mm -hmm. um, that's been um, thought about, or it's being th thought about more so with biochar, because mm -hmm. biochar is um, so hard for microbes to digest. It becomes more of an idea of, okay, so now we're we want to take rather than rather than increasing the the inputs versus outputs or thinking about that you're really just taking pieces of carbon and burying it away where it can't be accessed that would be the idea for that um, for burying it the issue with with tilling is that mm -hmm. tilling would disrupt the soil structure which in turn tends it has been shown to release a quite a lot of greenhouse gas emissions and specifically carbon dioxide depends on what's in there, but um, can also release nitrous oxide as well, which is a very potent greenhouse gas. So tilling isn't a great option for that. Um, injection into soil or into other places, you know, I'm not sure what kind of a, um, I'm not sure what, what kind of potential is there. Uh, it seems to me like absolutely there are definitely um, fewer active microbes at in, in the subsoil. So injecting something that's more biologically mm -hmm. inert into the subsoil could absolutely, you know, take that carbon away from the active carbon cycle. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that I would say that makes it less appealing to just ask farmers to do that on a wide scale is that there aren't really any co-benefits. It's carbon sequestration for carbon sequestration's sake, which is what we need right now, but also the co-benefits of applying compost is not only carbon sequestration, but also this added water potential, uh, water holding capacity, and they're seeing more grass growth and et cetera, et cetera. So we don't expect that to be quite as popular of a, of a strategy. Right, that's a great answer, thank you. Um, so another thing that you mentioned is that carbon sequestration is also dependent on or related to kind of there's this feedback with climate change. So how do you expect carbon se sequestration to change based on climate change projections? Uh, I'm glad you asked that. We actually, with our modeling efforts that I showed you one aspect of, we ran the model assuming a number of different climates into the future, mm -hmm. um, assuming it, it got wetter in California and warmer, or assuming it got drier in California while it got warmer. We know we're pre pretty certain that it's going to get warmer. Um, but we, we also, it depended on exactly how much uh, emissions reductions we would see. So we modeled a, a four different scenarios for each of the sites. And what we found is that the while it does matter in terms of overall temperature impact and, and carbon sequestration, we do see that that compost effect in terms of, a, of being a carbon sink tool was effective with or without the, those climate changes. So it does matter on a, on a broad scale whether or not we reduce emissions, but it is good news that, that it appears that carbon, um, that applying compost to grasslands will be effective um, no matter what happens in the future. Great. And we have two questions now. Um, I'm grouping these questions together because there's folks out here who, who think similarly. So that's great. So did you and your team consider the secondary effects of increased grass productivity? For example, if more cows graze um, on the more productive land, could that result in an increase in methane production? Because you know, cows are tied to methane. So what are these secondary effects? Again, sort of this whole feedback thing, right? We're seeing a lot of these things have consequences that are 
potentially bad or good or that are playing in effect at the exact same time? Absolutely. Great question. Well, so one of the things with that increased, the increased growth, also it, it becomes, you know, fuel for wildfire. Um, so hopefully if they're being, uh, being grazed regularly, and by regularly, most of our ranchers are grazing it intensively for a day or a few days maximum per year, or even less than that. So that's a, that's a pretty healthy grazing management strategy. And I'm not an expert on grazing management. I'm just saying what our ranchers are doing. Um, and, and they seem to be, to know their stuff. Um, so it's not grazed all that often. So having more cows in that area uh, is, it, they're likely to, to continue to graze the whole entire area because they're, they're set to a certain, impact, uh, certain area. Um, for a small amount of time, so they'll graze the entire area fairly equally. They might spend, like you said, more time on the area where there is more compost. Um, and in that case, we would expect to see, right, more nitrogen. If more cows are, are cows are there for longer, they're going to be peeing there. They're going to be doing other stuff there, um, which will release more nutrients, and those are definitely more volatile. We did not consider that any, we would not consider that in the modeling. So it is something that we're interested in. I have a feeling that the difference wouldn't be significant given that it's like one day per year or less. Right. right. Great. Thank you for that also. And we're just going to close out with, there seems to be a movie plug on here, which I'm excited to watch. Um, have you guys heard of the movie Kiss the Ground about managing soil carbon sequestration? It's coming out on Netflix on September 22nd. Um, so no, you haven't heard of it, Allegra? No. What, what about you, Nancy? Um, I've heard about it, but I haven't looked into it. Yeah, so we'll, maybe we should all get together and watch it. <laughs> we can do a group viewing. Um, the, this person says, it seems like a simple solution we could implement all over the world. So we're not sure. We'll have to get back to you all about what, how that movie goes. I don't know. Sometimes Netflix, Netflix movies aren't the best scientifically you know, content-wise, so we'll have to find out. <laughs> But I think that that's going to be it. We're going to wrap up unless I, I'll give Nancy and Allegra one more chance. If you two have anything more you want to say that maybe didn't come up in a question. I just want to say thank you so much for having us. Um, and thanks everyone for listening and for your wonderful questions. It's really nice um, to hear from interested folks out there. Yeah, so many questions again. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I just want to echo that. Thank you so much for being engaged and taking an hour and a half out of your days to learn about the carbon cycle. Well, like Dee said, this is bringing us to the end of our event. Uh, before we close, I do just want to say thanks again to Allegra and Nancy for their presentations. And thanks to the audience for tuning in and as usual, asking really fantastic and great questions. Um, if you'd like to stay up to date on research coming out of either of our institutions, you can visit Science at Cal at scienceatcal.org berkeley.edu and berkeley lab at www.lbl.gov. Thanks again and hope everyone has a great afternoon.